possibility that aliens or UFOs exist. There's an average of 70,000 UFO sightings per year, which means there's 109, about 196 per day worldwide. In the United States, that one in every five believe in aliens, and one in every seven know of someone or have themselves encountered um, any type of extraterrestrial. Uh, in the, Bi the Bible was the very first time that um, aliens were documented, and the first photo was taken of a UFO in 1883. It's hard to believe that there is an alien somewhere because there's 100 billion planets in the galaxy and 20 billion Earth-like planets. If we were to draw a speck on this blackboard, we couldn't draw a speck small enough to just show our galaxy in comparison to the entire space. Um, the, on Earth, there's nearly um, seven, seven aircraft and UFO collisions daily, and it increases every year. And the other fact about space is in 2004, um, Mars was seen to have just as much methane gas as Earth, and methane gas is only produced by living organisms. Dating back to 1966 was when the first UFO encounter for the Reed brothers was experienced 70 yards away from their home in Sheffield, Massachusetts. It was said that a frail human with some characteristics that might reference a young being was young and in the open. A year later, their second encounter occurred where the Reed brothers found themselves to be in a pressureless silence area which seemed to be the spacecraft for what was an undetermined time of two seconds or 20 minutes. Three years later, after the first encounter in Sheffield, Massachusetts, it was reported that the mother and grandmother of the Reed brothers were with them driving home on Route 7 when lights, change of pressure, and silence again occurred and Thomas was no longer in the car. He was in what was called a huge hangar. The four family members recall being in a different section of the spacecraft before the family members explicitly ended up in the car again. But this time, Thomas said, his mother was in the passenger seat, and at least 40 people saw the spacecraft and had made reports. The last reported encounter by the Reed family came from Matt Reed when he was living in Brownsburg, Indiana. He was driving home where lights had appeared inexplicably and again found himself in the spacecraft where everything was, was glowing. He recalled seeing three different types of aliens that night, a reptilian one, an alien that resembled a kind commonly seen in pop culture and a larger one with elephant skin. He reported that he can't make sense of anything that happened. They put him on a table, felt as though something was in his head, sounded like he heard the radio, and then dialed left and right, with which he woke up, with which he woke up, and had reported it to his family with which it had seemed like it was not. All right, so not many people actually know this, but there's a great deal of former NASA employees and former astronauts who have actually uh, witnessed aliens and UFOs in their encounters in space and just flying in the sky. So um, one of the first I'm gonna talk about is Joseph A. Walker. He's a former NASA pilot who on, in uh, April of 1962 was given a task to detect UFOs during his X-15 flight. He filmed a group of six UFOs during his record-breaking 50-mile high flight, but to date, none of those films have been released to the public for viewing. Another person is Donald Slayton, who is a former USSR and NASA astronaut. Donald, in 1951, while testing a P-51 fighter in Minneapolis, he spotted an object. He was at 10,000 feet when he reported seeing what he originally thought was a kite. He then realized that there was not a, that a kite could never fly at that height. And as he got closer, he realized the object was much bigger than a kite. He described it as a saucer of disc-like shape. Once he got really close, he noticed that the object started moving away from him, even though he was flying at a max speed of 300 miles an hour. He tried to track for a little while, when suddenly it took a 45-degree angle and climbed up into the sky 
and started accelerating extremely fast and vanished right before his eye. He told his commanding officer what had happened, and his officer told him to go to intelligence and give them on board. And after reporting the incident, the, in, the, the event, Slayton never heard anything more on it. This next story brings us to the moon. And we all know about the Apollo 11 flight when Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin became the first two humans to walk on the moon. During the Apollo 11 moon landing, there was a two minute period of radio silence. According to NASA, the problem arose from one or two television cameras overheating, thus disrupting the reception. But there's a lot of speculation that this was not the real reason why there was a two minute period of silence. Many sources claim that Neil Armstrong reported seeing two UFO spacecrafts on a crater on the moon during his two minutes and that that's why NASA cut out the audio. Otto Binder, who's a former NASA employee during the Apollo 11 flight, and multiple ham radio operators who were receiving this uh, transmitted signals directly from the Apollo 11 flight and not from the NASA headquarters, reported intercepting the following message that occurred during the two minute window of silence, which was mission control reporting to Apollo 11 saying, what's there? Mission control calling Apollo 11. Or Paul would have answered, these babies are huge, sir, enormous. Oh, God, you wouldn't believe that. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater. They're on the moon watching us. Maurice Chadwin, who's the former NASA communication systems, the chief of NASA communication systems at the time, in 1979 came out and reported that two, uh, two UFO sightings were indeed reported by an animal. He was quoted saying, the encounter was common knowledge in NASA, but nobody has talked about it until now. Maurice was also quoted in that same interview saying that all of all the Gemini flights were followed, both at a distance and sometimes also quite closely, by space vehicles of extraterrestrial origin, flying saucers, UFOs, if you want to call them that. Every time it occurred, the astronauts in full mission control were then ordered out of speed sign. When speaking about the Paul 11 flight and the 25th anniversary of the flight, Neil Armstrong said that there was a great, there are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers, which protective layers, truth's protective layers is a bit sketchy when he said that because it sounds like he's trying to say that he was hiding something about the truth of that experience. The final and most credible UFO sighting from an astronaut is made from Major Gordon Cooper, a U.S. Air Force pilot and Congress astronaut who was given the NASA Distinguished Service Medal by John Kennedy. In 1951, Cooper and a number of other pilots were flying over Germany. They witnessed seeing what they estimated as around 100 UFOs flying above them in formation at speeds much faster than their planes. They couldn't tell exactly how high the UFOs were because they couldn't get anywhere near their altitude. They reported the incident and it was never officially explained and kind of just written off by the government. Again, in 1957, out in a California base, in an Air Force base in California, Cooper was the project manager of the test center in the California base. He sent out a crew to film the installation of a precision landing facility that they were putting on the edge of a dry up lake bed. While filming, his men saw a saucer that they had reported big enough to fit normal sized people. The saucer landed in the bed and three legs extended from it. So the men tried to get close to the saucer and they filmed while rolling film. And as they got closer, it floated up, the legs went up into the spacecraft, and it shot back up into the air. So so Gordon's men came back to him with this film. He had them go run it immediately while he called in the headquarters to find out what to do. Well, by the time he got back with the film, he was already on the phone with a commander in Washington who gave him orders to give the film to a courier who was on their base and fly it in one of their base planes to Washington immediately, and he was informed not to make copies. That film has never been seen or heard from again. Another was the Washington National Airport in 1952, and shortly before midnight on July 19, air traffic controllers at Washington National Airport picked up three UFOs on the radar. Over the next three and a half hours, the targets would disappear and reappear in the schools. They were visually corroborated by incoming flight crews, so they went to go and uh, 
They went to go and check it out. At 3 a.m., the Air Defense Command dispatched two F-94 fighter jets to intercept it, which failed in their contact. Later in the following weekend, the same scenario happened virtually identical to what was described. The targets were picked up on the radar and identified by both incoming pilots and this time ground crew. This time, they just made contact and they just established the connection on the radar screen that they were able to identify anything. After this event, so many calls came into the Pentagon alone that the telephone circuits completely filled up with people calling about UFO related incidents or things that they've seen. So after all this happened, they had a so called Washington Wave, and the military held its greatest, its largest press conference since the end of World War II, which at the time was like the biggest thing that happened. So it's just topping that. Major General John Sanford, Director of Air Force, Intel Air Force Intelligence, and Major General Roger Randy, Chief of the Air Defense Command, denied any interceptors in the scramble and said the radar returns with its temperature inversions. So there's really no evidence whatsoever of this happening with the recent releases. Um, a small fact about Egypt is that over 5,000 years ago, they found images like drawn on the pyramids that look similar to UFOs and aliens, like the disc shape and the aliens with small head, big eyes, like what we would like typically like project aliens to look like. Um, also in France, Napoleon Bonaparte, also known for the French ruler that tried to take over the earth, um, was when they found his skeletal remains, he had like UF, UFO looking objects like embedded into his skull. So I don't, they don't know if they, when they buried him, they put the in them, put that in him, or if they were there while he was living. Um, also, Area 51, a training base, a training and testing base located 100 miles north of Las Vegas, Nevada, um, is commonly known for a place where the government keeps proof of aliens. Um, rumors started when an alleged UFO crashed in New Mexico, Roswell, New Mexico, and allegedly the remains of the UFO and a tiny unearthed like person or driver of the spacecraft was brought to Area 51. Um, from there, the government was allegedly went to great lengths to make sure none of that got out. They did uh, originally come on like the news and say that a, a UFO spacecraft crashed into um, Roswell, New Mexico. But then, like hours later, they went back on the news and said that it was a weather bubble, which is like this thing that scientists use. They put helium inside of it and they like test like weather conditions. Um, for years, map makers, Area 51 is like a sketchy place that people don't really know that much about. Um, for years, map makers weren't even allowed to put Area 51 on a map if they were making a map. Um, also, when people work there, they have to sign an oath of secrecy. And uh, in 1989, um, Rod Robert Laser, a national went on national, national news claiming that he used to work there and that when he worked there, they um, were, he was part of an alien technology operation. From there, when he was working, um, he, they found, like the government found that a lot of the stuff that he said that he worked on and he worked with when he was living on base at Area 51 wasn't true, but he like had a rebuttal that they obviously had a reason to cover it up and also, um, it was found that like he said they had a master's degree from Caltech and MIT, and it was found that he was lying. He went back and said that the government was trying to erase him from uh, from like the world, and uh, like a lot of conspiracists, like crazy conspiracists, n not only think that there's aliens he at Area 51, they also think that they aliens control it and that also that um, it is like designed to eventually have world domination. And it's possible to see UFOs at Area 51, but it's also the rebuttal to that is that um, it's, a, t it's a, it, um, a, a training and testing place for the military, so they do test their aircraft there. So even with all this information you find, even if you could dispute almost all this evidence to some sort of crazy conspiracy theory, you can't discredit everything. Just 
fact that there is so much possibility for uh, other life out there on Mars, and there has to be, like, we are definitely not alone, and there's definitely is, there's got to be life out there somewhere. It's one of the statistics for the universe. I think we're alone. 